welcome to the wonderful world of Unreal. I'm going to walk you through a, a quick little intro uh, that I think that you might find useful for concept art. So the first thing you need to do is set up an account and uh, download the Epic Game Engine uh, launcher, I should say, which is right here. And there's all kinds of really amazing uh, example projects which you can find online uh, in the marketplace. If you go to learn, you can download a whole bunch of these things. I strongly recommend downloading Boy in His Kite, Open World Demo, Landscape Mountains, Reflections, Realistic Rendering, Sun Temple, you know what? Particle effects, just download anything that catches your eye and start poking around in it. But for the purposes of this particular demonstration, I'm going to be using Soul City, which you can find here in the marketplace. Just type in S O U L. Yeah, Soul City or Soul Cave. So I'm going to be using Soul City, and you'll download that. Now this is something that you need to add to a project which is already existing. So go ahead and launch Unreal, and then I'll just show you how to do it. Okay, so we launched Unreal, and now we just go to New Project, and you name it. We're going to call this one. Concept art paint over. Okay. Create the project. So I imagine that you're going to be receiving assets and levels at various states of completion. And I'll show you how to more easily isolate objects, make masks, and render out still frames uh, for your own purposes. You might even, uh, yeah, we'll even make a couple of cameras and stuff too. I'm going to quickly cover how to navigate the space and some other basic things that you need to know. All right, so this is our empty level. This is just a default level. There's not really anything here. There's a couple of things that you can poke around and learn about, but right now this isn't what you need. What we want to do is we have concept art paint over here, and we want to add the Soul City to a project. So we click on that, we click on Concept Art Paint Over, Add to Project, and you can see down here that it is sending all of the information that we have downloaded up here into our Concept Art Paint Over project. While that's doing its thing, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to the workspace. So this uh, We'll start here on the bottom. This is your content browser, clearly labeled on this tab. And this is where you can find a lot of the things that you need to do. This is where you can import objects and materials and all of that sort of thing. Up here on the top left, this is what, um, this is where all of the, I guess, engine uh, oh, what's the word? You know English is my first language. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, these are all the things that you can use to populate your scene. So lights and basic geometry, uh, visual effects, including different types of fog. But most of this isn't really going to be that important to you, I think, except for maybe lighting and stuff later on. 
these sorts of things you also probably don't need to worry about too much for right now. So we're just going to stick with this first light bulb in cube menu. Uh, up here you have some other things that you also don't really need to worry about that much. Save current. Sure, you can worry about that. Don't worry about the rest of that stuff either for right now. Your world outliner, your layers, and your details. You're going to do a lot of things over here as well, which are important. And I'll point out a couple of things up here in our workspace as well. But I believe that we have finished. Yep, all of that stuff has been downloaded into our project, Soul City. And let's open up a level. Levels are usually saved in the maps section. So let's go ahead and open up LV Soul Slum. Let's double click on that. This is pretty awesome. Okay. So let's just start with navigation. This is the scene as it appears right when you open up the level. Uh, right click and move your mouse around. This will give you your stationary camera motion and left click and drag your mouse will help you to navigate within the space on, uh, on the X, Y axis. If you want to move up and down, if you want to pan on the Z axis, uh, Unreal has the Z axis pointing up and X, Y is front and back. I know that's a little different than most other uh, 3D applications. But that's the way it is. All right, middle mouse click drag is how you can pan along the Z axis. Okay, and that is your basic navigation. All right, so let's say that we want to just do a quick paint over of some section here. Let's say we need to extend this building up or something like that. All right, there's a few things we need to do. So first, I'm trying to click on this building, but I can't. You can see here that a simple fog sheet is in my way, which is what this bar is. This fog sheet here is blocking my path. So I can click it off. I'll try and click it again. Lo and behold, there's another fog sheet. I try and click it again. And now there's some kind of light beam. Let's try it again. Now there's the rain. Good Lord, why can't we just click on this thing as we want? Well, fear not. I'll show you one way to get all around that. So we have all of this rainstorm. Let's go ahead and scroll down the world outliner. Shift click. Now we've selected all the rain. Let's go over to Layers, right-click, Add Selected Actors to New Layer, click. We'll just call this Rain, and we're going to hit the I. So now none of that rain is there. And finally, hey, we can select that building we were talking about. And selecting that building, well, there's a reason for that, a reason why I wanted to do that. We'll get, we'll get there in a minute. But first, I want to show you the little gizmo. This is just like in other 3D packages. Click and drag to move it around. Control Z undoes your last action. Uh, w, E, R gives you options for scaling, rotation, etc. So if I want to scale this on the Z axis, I can just click and drag up and down. I can click and drag on the other axes as well to get a different look. If I want to do uniform scaling, just click in the middle of the gizmo and drag it. Or alternatively, you can use these transform buttons over here. 
if you want to have uniform scaling, make sure that your uh, lock is closed. And now you can just type in a number here and it will change uniformly across the board. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, I think. Now, if you're going to be doing any lighting or something, you can click over here, light, click and drag a point light. And I'm sure most of this stuff is stuff that you want to do in post, uh, or in Photoshop, I should say. But if for whatever reason you want to do some lighting, let me introduce you to that really quickly. So you have two basic kinds of, uh, well, you have three lights, but you have two basic kinds of lights that you're going to use for your detail lighting. You have your point light, which you can change here in intensity and attenuation radius. Also, if you want something much brighter, you can go ahead and come down to the um, let's see, where did it go? Ah, click on this arrow and click on inverse square fall off. So this is a more realistic and computationally heavy uh, option, but if you just if you want something really bright, you can use um, I think a geometric fall off. And obviously these lights are much brighter. Okay. You can change the color over here. And if you want long light for some reason, let's say you want like a long kind of halogen lamp or something, you can change the source radius and the source length. And this can give you some nice cool sort of light, which is longer than a sphere light. This can be a cheap and easy way to kind of light a large section of the scene if you want. Also, spotlight, rotate that, pull it out, and this is going to light things in the same fashion. That's as bright as it goes. Now, even though you can drag the slider up to, what is that, 100,000 here, you can type in larger numbers as well. And that's another option but I'm going to go ahead and turn off the square fall off. And I'm going to increase the attenuation radius until I get the look that I want. What's so fun about doing this in Unreal is how immediate the results are and how pretty everything looks with just a little bit of basic setup. So that's just some basic lighting. But let's say you don't want to do any lighting at all. Take care of that. Ah, look up in a world outliner. Uh, I want to explain something real quick. Um, when you are working with this, you can do baked lighting, and there's all kinds of things that you have to worry about for um, the real time game engine, making sure that you have uh, the most efficient lighting system set up. But for the purposes that we're exploring, uh, especially concept art, we don't really care how efficient the game runs. We're just making things look pretty uh, in a very early stage. So let's go ahead and click our lights over to movable. You'll see a little light, but there's a little dot that changes from yellow to orange. And that just means that the engine doesn't have to um, rebuild or recompute the lighting. It's always going to be 
computing the lighting uh, in real time fresh. And that can be a very expensive uh, process for the computer uh, and the graphics card to do, but again, we don't really have to worry about that since we're working on generally stronger high-end computers and we don't have to worry about playback, gameplay, and all of that stuff. Okay, but where was I? Okay, let's say we're going to do a paint over now with this and we need to, I don't know, extend this building up or something with a paint over. Well, one easy thing you can do is you can just Alt, click, drag on a, another piece of geometry that's already there. And that can give you a super easy way to do some kit bashing for concepting before you even take anything to, um, to Photoshop, which is pretty cool. I'm going to show you something else which might come up. I'm going to rotate this all the way around and you'll notice that the texture here is kind of invisible. That's not what we want. What's happening? I'll show you. Click on that and if you look down here in the details panel this is where our material is and without going into um, too much detail Let's just double click on that and it will reveal another workspace for us. And this is our this is one of our texture workspaces, but this is an instance. Let's go ahead and find the original uh, the master parent version of this. We'll double click on it. And this is how this particular texture is built. Don't worry if this looks uh, confusing or complicated. For our purposes, we just want to make sure that that texture uh, has a back to it, it doesn't look invisible, and we just click this button, two-sided. And then we push apply, and then we can go back to our workspace, and now you see that we have a two-sided texture. Easy, right? I'll find another one, just to go through that again real quick. Is this an invisible? Yep, this one is too. So we'll just click on that. Oh, this has a whole bunch of textures associated with it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to click on this. Maybe I'll get lucky. This is also an instance. Let's click on the master. And you can see here that it is not two-sided. So just click on two-sided. Apply. And now that texture has a back to it that we can see. All right. So I'm not sure what this wall texture is here, but if I were to continue going through all of those textures and making them double sided, then that would solve the problem. We're supposed to be doing a paint over, right? Right. Okay, well, when we do paint overs, I know that you generally like to have less atmosphere because we're going to paint that in. So you can come over here and, uh, depending on how well the scene is set up by whoever you're working with, it might be a simple matter such as this, just turning things off. Maybe it's more complicated. Depending on how things are set up, you can also just type in whatever's up here. And things will have labels like oh, a fog. And turn all this stuff off. Whatever that even is, I don't know. Okay. Well, if we're going to do a paint over of this, we want to do a couple of things. Right now, I'm just using a camera, which is uh, a default working camera. And I want to have a little more control over that. So I'm going to go to uh, Cinematics. I'm going to uh, add a master sequence. 
I'm just going to click the default, everything there. I'm not going to be doing any camera moves or any kind of animation right now. We're just going to choose some cameras. And this has different shots for an animatic. We don't need any of that. Well, we need one of them. So I'm just deleting all of them. And I'm going to have one left. I'm going to jump inside of it. You can see here, Sequence Master. Here's our shot one. Double click it. And now we're inside this uh, shot. There's a default camera which is placed. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And come up here to Cinematic. Cine Camera Actor. Click and drag it inside. And we're going to go ahead and name this Concept Cam 1. All right. Now we need to add this camera down here to our sequencer. Click on Track. Now since I've already got it selected up here in the Outliner, it's at the top here when I try and add it. Uh, if for some reason I have something else selected, that other thing that I've selected will be at the top of the list, but I don't want to add that to my sequencer. I want to add my camera, so I can just type in the search bar, concept, cam1 pops up. I click it, and now here it is. We can easily select and control this camera. Now, if I want to... All right, before we were looking through here, I kind of like that shot, but we're not looking through an actual camera that I can change the um, focal length and all that on. So let's click on our concept camera and click on the little camera icon, and it will show up here in the select viewport. And you can see now that we have a different focal length. And let's go ahead and start messing around with that. Click on the concept cam, and over here in the details panel, there are a bunch of options. Let's start here with current camera settings. You can choose 16.9 film, DSLR, yada yada. Uh, that's up to whatever your project is. I'm just going to stick with the default 16.9 DSLR. And since this is going to be some kind of epic upward looking shot, I'm going to I'm going to stick with a somewhat wider lens. I can do that by changing the focal length here. Cool. All right. I still have all this fog. I turned it off before I turned it back on. All right. Let's say that this is the shot that we like. We're happy with the camera. Okay, we can just right click and we can lock this camera now so we don't accidentally move it around like that. Uh, if you ever do that, if you move around like that, don't worry. That's not the actual camera that you just clicked on. Click over here and we're right back where we started. All right, so that's our shot. Now, when you're given a screenshot, probably what happens is the artist uh, will click up here to this arrow. They'll go to high resolution screenshot, click it. Maybe they'll double the size of it right there. And they'll just take a screenshot. Let's open that up and see how it looks. Let's go ahead and open that up in Photoshop real quick. All right, so here's this in Photoshop. And as we zoom in, you can see this is 100%. And there's no masks or anything like that. Also, it looks like the, uh, because it was a screenshot, these little bits of the game icons were also captured. And we want to get rid of that. So we have a couple things to do. First, when you're working inside here and you don't want these to be in your painting for the paint over, you can push G 
for game mode, and that gets rid of all those things. Also, here's the fun important thing. You can put your size multiplier on there, and that will give you double or triple the resolution, which is on your screen. Now, I'm going to show you another fun thing. So there is a quick way to isolate and export a single pass depending on uh, the circumstance of your camera and the scene and other variables. Uh, it could be a quicker and faster way to do it. So I'm going to jump out of my camera here real quick. I'm just going to eject and I'm going to approach a little bit closer part of the scene. Let's say that you want to do a little bit of uh, work on this uh, bit of industrial machinery here. And you can click on Use as Custom Depth Mask as we had set up before. You can see I don't have it set up. So let's go back down here, Use Custom Depth Pass. Let's click it. Click this button here. And since we're nice and close to it, we'll be able to go ahead and do a quick screenshot of that. Click, open it up. Let's open that up in Photoshop and take a look at it. Perfect, look at that, we've already got a mask. You can see a little bit of stuff over here from the other things which we have isolated but we have a perfectly masked and rendered element here that we can start doing whatever kind of work we want to on which is great unfortunately that doesn't work for everything especially if you're going to be working on landscapes and let me show you what i mean so we uh, let me turn off the custom depth pass and let me turn this off too. Let's go back to our concept cam one. Let me click it. We'll look at our shot. And let's say that we want to isolate this main group of buildings here. Select our actors. Let's make sure we have custom depth pass turned on. Use this custom depth mask. And you see that it's getting cut off at the top a little bit. I'm going to eject my camera and just show you what's happening. There's a little bit of a there's a sphere of influence. You can kind of see that sphere cutting through at the top up here, revealing bits of the geometry. There are ways around it, but unfortunately, it's not as quick and easy as it was isolating something that's closer to the camera. But that's a great method if you're just working on something which is close to the camera like this. You want to isolate it and render out a quick mask. That's a super easy way to do it. But in this example, it's not going to be that easy. So we're going to turn off Use Custom Depth as Mask here. And we're going to do the Include Buffer Visualization Targets. We're also going to write HDR formats. And we're going to do Force 128 bit buffers. Let's see if everything works. Actually, let me turn off my 128. Okay, we're just going to keep this as a one-to-one -one rendering. I'm going to push G uh, just to make sure. Actually, no, I'm going to leave that on so you can see something interesting about the renders. So I'll click that. I'll let it render, and we'll take a look at it. In the meantime, let's talk philosophy, politics. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, probably just going to sing a song. Now you see why I didn't go into a career in music. Okay. Let's open up some of those passes. Open. Let's go to this one. Hey, that's not where they are. 
those things go. Get out of there. Let's just do this. Ah, there they are. Okay. So we'll see the screenshot that we just took. Still has some of our. Is that the one we just took? I'm so organized. Are you impressed? What is the day? 12th? Yeah, this looks right. Okay. Yeah. So we still have uh, some of these on-screen icons and stuff in the in the basic screenshot. You can also see on the size here, it's not a very large file. <clears throat> Excuse me. But these other passes, some of which are a bit larger, do have the information that we want. So we'll go ahead and take a look. Open. So if I can open this up in Nuke, uh, it'll be a much easier thing for me to show you what's going on. But for right now, <clears throat> excuse me. For right now, let's just open up our scene depth world units, our scene color. Yeah, we'll do scene depth if I haven't touched on that already. Let's just see what these are. Okay, and here's some of our different passes in a completely differently scaled workspace. Start over. It's in my Unreal folder. Okay, there we go. Let's take a look. So here's just our regular screenshot right there. But let's open up these other passes and take a look at them, shall we? Now we can use these passes for any way that we see fit. I'm sure that you'll find your own workflow that works best for you. And it's also worth noting that a lot of the uh, output render that we see here don't look exactly like what we saw on the screen. For example, uh, this is a lot darker here in the live space, but when we jump over to our Photoshop frame, everything looks a lot lighter. So you'll notice that 
the screen space that we see here doesn't look like what is being rendered on the screen, and that's because of a color space difference. So you see how much lighter it, the render looks like, the output render looks in our Photoshop pass compared to the Unreal pass. And that is a issue of color space, which we can fix pretty easily. And we'll just do that by going to adjustments levels. And in the middle section here, we need to adjust our gamma to 0.454545. And now if we compare it again, we'll see that this looks like the same color space. Sweet. Well, that's cool. Okay. But we've been we've been tasked in this imaginary scenario with, uh, let's say, painting in something in the background there, doing some kind of, um, let's say, matte painting or concept with the background. And we can easily select the sky area over here. You would think, but we can't do it because, as you can see here, we need to convert the image, and that's just fine. Uh, we can go ahead and do that, image mode adjustments, and we'll drop that down to 8 bits. We'll just say fine. We just want the mask. We'll do that, and we'll do it on the other side. Right. Copy. Let's come back here. Just paste that. We can use this as our mask. Okay, so now we have our sky mask. Looks like we're gonna have to do a little work with the defringing there, but it's enough to start with. Now we can create our clipping mask. We can get to work. So we can still reveal the original lighting down there. That's fine, maybe we can grab some colors from over here and get to work. With our painting. And this is basically the process which can be used for your concepts. I'm sure you have your own methods which are going to be far more interesting and better looking than my own, but here it is. There's a few other things we can do with our passes uh, in the foreground. Uh, obviously, we can work on our background image all day if we want, which is great. It'd be a lot of fun to see that. I personally love watching those kinds of paint over uh, speed paints and tutorials myself a whole lot. But that is not our purpose for the moment. I want to give you some more insight about how to use these different passes. All right, the first thing that I want to do is to actually replace this uh, base screenshot that we have here uh, with one of the uh, HDR captures that we have. 
So I've got this um, post tone map HDR color set up. And this is too bright. It's not matching our color space. So we're going to do the same thing that we did before and go up to image adjustments levels. And we're going to type in 0.454545. And that's going to put us in the correct color space. I'm going to copy this and jump over to the workspace. This is not the one. My apologies. This one right here. And I'm just going to paste that over the bottom. And you can see that we have a matching uh, plate. All right. Now we have some other things that we want to work with. Let's say that we want to, for whatever reason, easily select part of one of these buildings. Of course, we'll do whatever's fastest. So maybe we could do this, get a nice square selection of the face. And we can make whatever changes we want on it, which is just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. We can get uh, a more detailed selection by using select color range. Uh, which is over here, select color range. Okay, we'll just select that part. Maybe we'll stick to our localized area. This gives us maybe something a little more precise than what we had before. And that's also fine, but Let's say we want to look at these passes. Now, I went ahead and put all of these passes in a single file, so it will be easier for us to review here in Photoshop. And let's see if we can't find a pass that might help us more easily isolate that face. These are all the passes that we have. This might work. So we can use our world normal pass here and we can apply some various levels and exposure adjustment to it to help us isolate some areas of detail. Oh, hey, check that out. So I'm just gonna copy that one part. I'm going to copy that one part, and I'm going to paste it in my workspace as soon as I find it again over here. All right. There's our selection. Now we can clean that up a little bit. Just get rid of our darks. That on five. There we go. All right. Here's our little mass flare. We've got little bits of texture and detail in there as well. And we're going to just select that color. Select color range. We'll click that. And now we can either paint within this selection, if we like, with a little more flexibility than we had before, or we can just use this pasted area and make any adjustments we want to make to it that way. Use our blending modes. Anyway, you get the point. You can do whatever you want or need to do with a little bit more accuracy 
and potentially speed. Uh, I know that this might not be the best example of that, but hopefully you can see the potential of uh, being able to get access to this face here without having to paint out these shadows or paint around these blooms or anything like that. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Let's say we want to just change the texture. And we're just going to cut out the windows only. So we will make a mask of that. And we'll do the same thing up here. Now let's say we want to add some new texture to this or something. Uh, so first I'm going to take all the color out of that. And then let's access our texture layer, which is going to be over here, not here. Uh, where's that unlit? Hmm. Oh, it's probably down here in this other folder. Yeah, there it is on the way bottom. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, right here. So there's just the texture. I'm going to go ahead and copy that, just the texture, and paste it. And I'm going to add it as a clipping mask, so that's still there. And let's say I want to make a little graffiti. Let's do that real quick. Make some quick graffiti. There we go. Put this on a clipping mask. Hit it with the multiply. Now, we could technically find another pass which would prevent this pipe from being in front of it, but as always, speed is king in this sort of thing, so I'll just do it that way. All right. And let's go ahead and hit this as well as a multiplier. Or maybe a screen. A bit too bright. There you go. We have a much more well integrated looking texture. And of course, these are things that we could have done by hand. I'm sure that you will find many uses for this technique uh, when you find yourself in a, in a spot where you need it. So I hope that this has been helpful. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive tutorial on this sort of thing. Uh, it's an introduction, which I hope that you have found useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. If there's anything you don't understand, I'll be happy to go over it again. All right, good luck and happy painting.